Okay, everybody. Hi. Thanks for taking some time out of your Sunday to come hang out with me and obviously do the best thing you can do on a Sunday, which is obviously okay. All right, so I've allotted roughly 90 minutes, but let's be real, if we're having a lot of fun, we'll just go right past that, to do pretty much whatever we can do for OCHEM 1 under the sun. I kind of have like these 11 things right here that I want to go over. So the stuff in black, kind of the beginning, beginning content of OCHEM 1. So I'm thinking we can just you know, we'll talk about it. We might not get like, you know, hot and heavy with like too many examples, but I'm thinking we'll just kind of talk about the highlights from Gen Chem, alkane stuff. And when I say alkane stuff, I mean more like naming, cyclohexane things, uh, the free radical chain reaction, uh, anything contained to that. Then we'll talk about stereochem, which I think might be one of the more important things that will come back that you might see on one of your finals for OCHEM 1. Uh, not that it goes away in OCHEM 2. And then we'll, we can just briefly talk about SN2, E2, SN1, E1, because what the nice part is for this final, you're not really going to have to have uh, what you might have had on your second exam, where it was like, here's all these reactions. Now you need to tell me, is this SN1 and why, if you had to do that. Or pretty much, you know, you'll just need to know how to do them, but you won't have to decide, um, you know, given this generic reaction in these conditions what, like, choose between the four. But we'll go over them, we'll pick them apart. However, what I want to really, you know, do lots of examples on are the stuff in blue. And this is probably things from your third test that you may have had, um, if you had a third exam, but these are definitely gonna pop up on your final. Things like reactions with alcohols, and then, uh, to, I call them derivatives of alcohols, but pretty much a little bit more stuff with alcohols and things with ethers and epoxides. Um, then we move into, you know, alkene territory. I'm sure you've learned a lot of reactions uh, regarding alkenes uh, recently. So don't worry. It may seem like it's crazy and that there's so much going on, but we'll, you know, we'll take one reaction at a time. We'll pick them, one, uh, pick them each apart and we'll figure out that they're really not that bad. And I think they're kind of cool. Uh, then we'll talk about alkynes. We'll put everything together with some synthesis, which... If it seems scary now, don't worry. Hopefully by the end of this, yeah, you know, by 3 p.m., you're feeling like a boss. You're feeling like you're ready to hand handle any synthesis problem. Uh, then we'll talk about some NMR stuff. Um, and then within this synthesis practice, I did have, I did have uh, a part of the website where you could submit some problems. And uh, I don't know if Rachel, I don't know if you're watching, but shout out to you for actually submitting some good stuff. We'll be doing the problems you submitted uh, during the synthesis little part. Okay, so let me just erase this. And we will get started with some of the highlights before we really dive in and get our hands dirty with some problems. Okay, so with Gen Chem specifically, What I think uh, can be taken out of here that will probably come up on your, will, you know, you need to be comfortable with is acid-based stuff. So remember, it seems so long ago that we started learning this stuff for the first time, right? Probably like, you know, first two weeks that you were taking OCHEM. Remember that uh, it really, any acid-based problem in OCHEM really boils down to one of five things, one of five concepts that can help you figure out what's really going on in the problem, or like which side is favored at equilibrium if that's what you're trying to figure out. So remember, you can have some type of electronegativity thing going on. And by that, I mean, if I just throw up a really quick problem like this. Hydroxide plus ammonium, let's say there's an equilibrium going on. So we want to, you know, figure out which side of the equilibrium is uh, favored, is like what I'm trying to say with acid-base stuff. So you need to see which side of this equilibrium is favored. Pretty much it boils down to who can handle this negative charge better, right? Is it the oxygen and hydroxide or is it the nitrogen in this uh, NH2 minus ion? And really, you have to think about the relationship between the charged species. Who can handle this charge better? 
AKA who is more stable handling that charge, right? Because nature likes stability. And it comes down to the fact that on the periodic table, these guys are in the same row with each other. Sorry, that's a really poorly drawn section of the periodic table. Oxygen is more electronegative. Therefore, he likes electrons more. He can handle this charge better. He is more stable handling it. Therefore, this side is favored equilibrium because nature realizes this is where, uh, this is the side of equilibrium that is more stable, lower energy. Okay, that's what I'm, so these rules help us, you know, help us decide problems such as this, right? So another one can be size. The bigger the atom, the bigger size of the atom, the better it can hold a negative charge. I can give you a real quick example. I know I'll be running through these fast, but I want to get to the more interesting stuff. messy but basically we have to decide who can handle this charge better is it the sulfur in this organic compound sorry the sulfur in this organic compound or is it the oxygen right here well these guys are in the same column so sulfur is bigger the negative charge can spread itself out around that atom better than it can oxygen so this side would be favored at equilibrium because sulfur can handle the negative charge better then we can get into things like um, Hybridization. We'll come back to this one, and I'm just gonna go through the rest because we need to get moving. I'm gonna get. I could talk about any of this stuff forever, so I want to get to the better stuff. Hybridization, something called the inductive effect. These should all be familiar, and then the last one would be um, resonance. So obviously, resonance is something definitely not new, and if something exhibits resonance versus something that does not that structure that exhibits resonance is going to be much more stable than something that does not. Okay? That's really, I think the biggest thing that you should remember from Gen Chem, we'll be talking about drawing energy diagrams uh, in a future example, which is kind of in the, you know, the realm of what you would have uh, covered in Gen Chem. But in the interest of doing more relevant, newer, I think more difficult stuff, we are moving on. Okay. So, this racer is not the best, but that's okay. So, if we're going to talk about alkanes, just a few of the highlights, right? Definitely feel comfortable drawing cyclohexane uh, chairs and flipping chairs. So, if we had something pretty similar, just something basic like just a, a 1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane type deal, just be very comfortable drawing a chair. If that was way too fast, remember you can just do an upside down propane, come down to the middle of your propane, draw just a regular propane, connect the dots. Very easy, very idiot proof, whatever. So remember one, three, so I could just draw a methyl group here. That's the one position, the two position, the three position. Right here, my wedge on, if I call this one, doesn't matter what I call it, this would be going up, the three, this methyl group right here would be going down. So this would be going like this. Because remember, if we're at a peak, it's up axial, down equatorial. This is also a peak, so there's an up axial hydrogen, down equatorial methyl group. And remember when we go to do our flips. Yeah. This position is still here. Up always stays up, down always stays down. So now this up axial becomes up equatorial. And at the three position, this down axial now becomes, or sorry, down equatorial now becomes down axial. So just feel comfortable drawing your chairs and everything like that. Um, now, another thing that may be, so this, I mean, if you can think back to these, these nice, easy breezy times, this is definitely what I would consider you know, the chemistry before things got real. Now to, we will, if we have time, we'll do a naming problem at the end. But remember in this, because this is kind of like chapters two and three in, a, in the Voldhark textbook that I know Pitt uses. Um, there's a re free radical chain reaction. This was kind of like your very first reaction mechanism you learned. 
this will come in handy for synthesis on your final. So let's just review this real quick. So let's just say I had propane and let's just say I had, I exposed that propane to chlorine gas and some H nu, some light, right? Remember, chlorine is not picky, right? So if we were gonna do this reaction, what we could get, well actually I'll even make this, I'll make this butane. We'll get a, a pretty nasty split, but if you wanted to like guess what the major product would be, if you're using this in synthesis, remember chlorine is not as picky as bromine, so you will get um, this uh, one, one chloro butane product. However, remember, if you were to do this with bromine light, and I know some people like to throw heat in there because it's almost an endothermic reaction. Remember bromine, since this reaction isn't as you know, exothermic as fast as the chlorination, remember bromine's picky, right? So you will absolutely always get your halogen on the more substituted carbon here, right? Nothing on the primary carbons, but here it would be secondary. And as another example, right, if we even had isobutane here, Right, the chlorinated product would definitely be on one of the primary carbons, but the brominated product would easily be on this tertiary carbon. So just remember your free radical chain reaction, right? It seems like a long time ago, but Old Faithful will definitely come in handy come uh, final exam day. I think that is pretty much what I wanted to talk about as far as um as far as that stuff yeah so now i want to move on to the stereo chem we're going to spend a little bit more time here because we have some kind of terms to go over and i have some uh not brain teasers but some questions i think if we cover if we kind of tease them apart like just a little food for thought questions it'll really enforce some things about stereo chem because yeah, you can, you can assign RNS, but sometimes you need to be able to make sure you have the full foundation of what's going on. Okay, so, stereo chem. Okay, definitely no, you need to be able to assign RNS. If you don't, you're in some big trouble. Not that I'm assuming you don't. I'm, I know you guys are all part-time organic warriors, I know you definitely are able to do this. Um, assign RNS, you need to be able to uh, determine stereochemical, which is a big old fancy word, makes you sound real smart, stereochemical relationships. Okay, what I mean by that, right? So assigning RNS, right? Someone would give you a structure, something maybe even as basic as a carbon, just a one carbon structure with, uh, just, I don't know, something random, random like this, right? This would be lowest priority group facing away from you. Bromine would be highest priority. Chlorine second. Fluorine third, based on molecular weight, right? Bromine's the heaviest. Chlorine second heaviest. Fluorine third heaviest. Your lowest priority group is facing away from you. That means you can go ahead and just slap RNS configuration on it. So remember, we drive in a circle. Follow your numbers. It's like you're turning a steering wheel. So if you go to the right, that's R. However, if we go to the left instead of L, remember we use S. So this would be an S configuration. However, for number two, remember, you're going to get um, probably, you're going to get two things, right? You'll get something like this. We even use the exact same just to keep it easy because we already assigned this. I'm just going to randomly swap some things around. This can end up being the same stereo chem. I have no idea. Okay, right? So we know this to be S, this structure right here, right? So for us to assign a relationship between these two pairs, right, we need to figure out um, what this stereochemical configuration is. Lowest priority group is facing towards us, right? So I'm going to assign as normally, but I'm going to take the opposite configuration of what I get. Because normally, when it's facing away from you, you can just assign stereochem. But when the lowest priority group is facing towards you, you just assign and then take the opposite. So 
Uh, one, two, three. This looks like R, but it's actually S. So these are actually the same structure. However, had we gotten had we gotten R here, and this was S and R, right? That's like a left and right hand pair. We would have enantiomers, right? And let's just say I had a structure that had a configuration of an R at the two position, uh, an S at the three position, and then an R at the four position. But then I also was given a nut. This was structure number one. And then let's just say someone gave me structure number two. And that had a 2S, 3S, 4R, right? So they only differed at the one stereo center, right? Because we have three stereo centers here. This is not, remember, an enantiomer is like your left and right hand. If you have something here and then you have the complete opposite on your other structure, they are mere image of each other. They're enantiomers. However, right, if they're not quite mere images, but they're, they're different, that's remember when we have a diastereomer. Right, so, sorry, that example wasn't too great. This is a diastereomer. But for an enantiomer, if I had something like 2S, uh, 3R, 4R, but then I had that structure number one. And then for structure number two, I had uh, 2R, 3S, 4S, right? These are completely opposite, left hand, right hand type deal, enantiomer. Or, you know, when someone asks you, determine the stereochemical relationship, right? If you end up getting the same thing like we did over here, they could be the same structure. Okay? So, it's funny because it all boils down to assigning R and S, right? But if you just, if that's the only thing you know how to do, and you don't know your vocab just from stereochemical relationships, or, you know, how to trickily handle when your lowest priority group is not facing away from you, then you're going to be in some trouble, okay? All right. That is definitely, these are two big things. I would be very, very, very confident in saying you'll probably have to determine some stereochemical relationships on your final because that pretty much packs in, can this person assign RNS and can they figure out based on assigned configurations what two structures relationships with each other are, right? So that's a very typical thing teachers like to go with. Um, so one more thing. Um, we kind of need to talk about which really encapsulates all of this. So if something has stereochemistry, right? Like if something can have a mere image of itself, we're talking left hand, right hand, then it is said to be chiral. And if this is redundant, I'm sorry, but like I personally, when I first was learning OCHEM, thought I knew what chiral meant, but I really didn't. I was lying to myself. Um, I just had a false sense of thinking I knew what it was. So, it's being chiral means you have a non-superimposable mirror image of yourself, which means if I'm the left hand, right, I have some partner that exists, which is my right hand, and if I tried to superimpose them, put one on top of the other, they're not the same. I bring that up, right, that's being chiral. Now, I'm sure you've heard of this word, I'm sure you've heard of being meso, okay? Now, being meso is the opposite of being chiral. Being meso means you have symmetry. That would be like if I was like a Charlie Brown cartoon and I just had four fingers and my hand looked identical. I could like, you know, very similar to, I am not a good artist, so I apologize. Something like this, right? I could draw a line straight down the middle, right? If I had an, another hand of this, I could slide it over and it would match up perfectly. That's what being meso is. This is, this is being... So when you're meso, you are not chiral, you are achiral. So, that's great in cartoon Charlie Brown world. What about, you know, the world of carbon? So, if I drew you guys a structure like this, I think it's very easy to see the plane of symmetry here, right? I use the fancy pink marker, because everything's more fun in pink. There's the plane of symmetry, right? 
you can easily take this bottom half and fold it over. It's very plain to see. The thing that is very confusing and weird is that even though this is an achiral structure, and this is something that's very, uh, it's weird to think about, it has stereo centers, right? Remember, a stereo center is just something that is attached to four different things. It's clear to see here that if I was going to assign my priority groups, this group would be priority one, right? Because this carbon's attached to one, two other carbons. My second priority group would be this carbon down here because he's attached to another carbon. And this methyl group would be third priority. I can assign R and S here, right? I would be going this way. This configuration, this carbon has an S configuration. Now, I could also do the same thing up here. This carbon has a uh, one, two, three, it's R. So it's weird to think that even though there is stereochemistry here, the structure is overall achiral because it has a plane of symmetry. So a very typical true and false question I've seen is um, a structure is chiral because it has stereocenters. Or like a structure, if a structure has stereocenters, it is chiral. Wrong. False. Because you can have stereocenters, but if you have a plane of symmetry, you are not, you're, you lose your chirality, your achiral, your meso. Okay? Just something I wanted to point out because it's a typical gotcha. Because usually you think, oh, stereocenter means that, you know, it's going to have a mirror image of itself. It's going to be chiral. Not a guarantee. You need to look for a plane of symmetry. Um, I think that is all I wanted to go over for stereochem. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just I wrote some things down I wanted to look, go over in this little book that you can't see off camera. Okay, yes. So, let's real quickly go over just a brief summary of SN2, E2, SN1, E1, and then we can plunge forward with, you know, more relevant problems, all that fun, good stuff. Yeah, this is taking me a second to place. Also, shout out to taking some time out of your Sunday to come hang with me. I, uh, I always have fun doing chemistry, but it's always fun to do it with friends. Okay, so let's go over SN2, E2, SN1, E1. Okay, so this is just going to be a quick little summary. No problems, but I promise because no problems, oh, I will not demonstrate any problems here. I'll make sure to reiterate this information when we do mechanisms that involve, you know, whether it's an SN2, E2 pathway moving forward in the review session. Okay. So remember, for SN2, for your substrate, and by substrate, I mean thing that it gets attacked, we like to have a methyl or a primary substrate because, remember, we don't like steric hindrance for SN2. The thing we attack needs to be available for the nucleophile to come in and attack from the backside, right? So substrate needs to be not sterically hindered, a.k.a. that is best when we have a methyl substrate or a primary substrate. So something like you know, methyl bromide or even like propyl bromide. Excellent uh, substrates for SN2. Having said that, right, we need to have a good leaving group. Good LG. And you'll see that that's the case with all of these uh, mechanisms because something's got to go. Something's got to pack his bags and leave town. Got to have a good leaving group. Um, we like to have, we need a good nucleophile. So let's think about that for a second. What that means is because nucleophile, lover of positive charge. So that means we need something that is, I'll get my red marker for this, something very negative, like Br minus, any good halogen like that. But remember, it needs to be a good nucleophile, but for SN2, remember, we want substitution. We don't want the elimination, which is plucking off that hydrogen. So we want a weak base. Remember something? Something very negative, however, something that is not good at abstracting a proton, taking off an H and forming the elimination product. Um, we like to also have, um, remember, for solvent, we like to have a polar 
aprotic solvent. Because remember, if we had something polar protic, polar protic being something, an electronegative atom attached to a hydrogen, right? Because then we have that protic effect right here, like water, polar protic solvent. Because remember, when you have a polar protic solvent, something like this would surround your nucleophile and trap it. We don't like that. So SN2, we like polar aprotic. Some examples, and you should definitely know these going into test day. Remember, we like acetone, right? Because you don't see any electronegative atom directly bonded to hydrogen. We like dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, and then I forget these structures, but DMF, um, I think HMPA. You won't need to know all of these, but this is DMSO. Definitely know one or two polar aprotic solvents. Put them right in your back pocket. I think that'll do it for SN2. And just remember, this is kind of like a, an, an af, uh, something that happens with SN2. Remember, stereochemical inversion. So remember, you do SN2, you better end up with the opposite stereochemistry after the fact. If you are R, then SN2 happens, you better be S. Okay, that's it for SN2. These two definitely involve most talking and then we we'll usually lay yeah, the groundwork for these two after the fact. So, oh, this is one step. Remember, one step, a concerted mechanism. This is also one step. So E2. All right, so pretty much the opposite of SN2. It's exactly what it is because they are competing reactions. We like to have more steric hindrance in that we like more substituted carbons. And by that, I mean something that is Secondary, tertiary. You can do elimination on a primary carbon. However, you better need a really, really big bulky base. Something's gotta be big. Um, more substituted carbons. Obviously, we need to have a good leaving group. Um, we need something negative, just like an SN1, or sorry, SN2 rather. But instead of a weak base and good nucleophile, we need a strong base. We need something that is a big fan of protons, big strong base that's going to rip them off super easily. Um, just like SN2, we like polar aprotic solvents. Same reason we don't want our base having any, uh, we don't want our base getting trapped on the way to getting to our um, substrate. And I think. The only like little gotcha remembered about this is remember SETSEF, which I know you can spell this a bunch of different ways. This is just how I choose to spell it. SETSEF or Hoffman elimination products. Um, and I'll even just draw two quick examples. Let's just say we had, uh, yes, let's say we had this substrate, right? Good leaving group, tertiary carbon. I'll make sure I use a polar aprotic solvent. Great conditions for elimination. If we were to use NH2 minus here, small base. Small base can get inside, closer to where there's slightly more steric hindrance, abstract the proton, which will help form the more substituted double bond. The double bond between the higher degree carbons, right? Tertiary, secondary. That will force the leaving group to leave. This will form the SATSEF product, the more stable product, because the double bond is between the highest degree carbons. However, if we use a big bulky base, something like potassium uh, tert butoxide, this big guy right here, or LDA, if you're familiar with that, these guys are packing some junk in their trunk. They are big. They are bulky. They are too big to get here. However, what they'll do what's easiest for them. They'll take the path of least resistance as far as size. So they actually grab a proton, these are equivalent spots, they grab a proton from over here instead of here. They form the lesser substituted double bond. So remember that in E2. Some, something you can expose in synthesis is if you need a double bond here, you know, between the more substituted positions, go with a small base. If you need it in the less substituted area, choose a big base. All right, SN1, and I'll try and get through this faster because we need to get moving. All right, S and one. So remember, uh, solvolysis happens in S and one, right? If we have something like this, your leaving group leaves, and you form a carbocation, right? 
So, solvolysis, which means we need a polar protic solvent to make solvolysis happen. The polar protic solvent helps wean off the leaving group. Polar protic, uh, we have cations, which means shifts, and we'll get to that. We'll get to shifts very soon. Um, you need a nucleophile, for sure. And because, right here, this carbocation has three bonding positions, it is sp2 hybridized, which means it is trigonal planar, right? That's its geometry. So when something attacks it, it attacks from here and here equal amounts. So if you have stereochemistry after the fact, you form racemic mixtures here. All things we will be seeing in problems coming up. Um, I think that's about it. All right, and E1. We don't really have to worry about this so much because E1, typically, if you have any E1, it's a minor side product. So, solvolysis happens in E1. Um, polar protic, that's your solvent. I will say the one thing to note about E1 is that if you want to favor an elimination product, add heat. Adding heat favors elimination. It goes back to like the entropy of the equation. However, adding heat favors, if you have an SN1, E1 uh, competing conditions, if you add more heat, it will favor the E1 product. Okay. Whew. Sorry, I drank a lot of cold brew before this, so I'm, I'm zooming. So hopefully I'm not talking too fast. So this is a pretty good overall overview of, um, you know, all SN2, E2, SN1, E1. However, it's time to get real. It's time to actually cross over from the more, you know, overview, talking about stuff type of uh, part of the review session. And now we're going to get hot and heavy with some problems. All righty. Okay. Okay, so. Where are we going to go first? Let's talk about alcohols. Okay, so I'm going to really go over the two sides of one coin, which is going to be oxidizing and reducing. Okay, let me look at my trusty notebook real quick. Um. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I'm also not answering the comments, it's because I'm not really looking. Uh, but this shirt is a one of a kind Joe Kim original. All right, so let's just talk about what we're doing here. So let's just say it's something basic like ethanol, right? What we can do is, um, luckily, I personally did not like it in Gen Chem whenever you had to do oxidation numbers and all that, you know, very meticulous thinking about oxidation states. Luckily, no chem, it's simple, which is weird. We don't say that too often, right? More bonds to oxygen means you're oxidized. So we can, and I'll even draw this a little bit nicer. We can oxidize at varying amounts with alcohols, right? Because if really what you're doing is just, you have your available bonds to the hydrogens on a certain carbon, and you're just going to pretty much replace your bond to hydrogen with another one to oxygen. So. Let's just say we wanted to go, we just wanted to replace one bond to hydrogen, right, to this oxygen, and make an aldehyde, right? That's what this functional group is. Make sure you definitely are comfortable with your functional group names. Um, so this is just basically one oxidation step, right? We can do that with this reagent. It's called PCC. Now, I've run into some teachers in the past that are pretty adamant about not letting you write names of reagents. So if your teacher is like that, Make sure you know the structure of what PCC looks like, which is unfortunate because it's so nice and simple to write PCC. So that's one level of oxidation. Now, if we even wanted, that's just replacing one bond to hydrogen. However, if you want to replace both of those bonds to hydrogen and fully oxidize this carbon, what you can do is uh, that would give us a carboxylic acid, right? Because here's our original OH, and we pretty much replace both of these bonds to hydrogen to this carbonyl. 
Now remember, when I say carbonyl, I'm just referring to a C double bonded O. This is a specific carboxylic acid, which is also a carbonyl. You can use these reagents right here. Na2Cr2O7 and H2SO4. Some teachers will also call this the Jones, or what is called the Jones oxidation. They'll let you write this instead of this. However, you can't go wrong with actually writing this down. Okay? So, if you, you will definitely need to know both of these. It might be a complete the reaction question. It might be something, you're going to need in synthesis. Promise you that. So, let me show you guys a quick example. And I like this example because it has a little bit of a trick that I've seen on uh, a final exam that I actually graded a while back. It's not the exact same problem, but it is, uh, it is I think, a good problem. Because these, this type of problem is a very easy uh, rack up the points type of problem. They're gimmies. Alrighty. So, let's just say I had this type of problem right here. If you see an oxidation problem with multiple oxygens, I would just assume whatever reagent you have is in excess, so oxidize wherever you can. So let's look at this. I see I'm using PCC, so I know that will take, um, it will oxidize one level. It takes primary alcohols to aldehydes, and it takes secondary alcohols to ketones. Um, so what do we have here? So I know that this right here will turn into an aldehyde. This will turn into a ketone. Now I'm not really sure about this alcohol right here. Now remember, we said we replace bonds to hydrogen with bonds to oxygen. So it's easy to see there's one here, there's two here. The trick here is that this tertiary alcohol, you can't oxidize ter tertiary alcohols because there are no bonds to hydrogen to replace, right? So your product looks like this. There's the ketone at the bottom. There's the aldehyde over here. And what people will do, which is why they'll get this problem wrong, is they'll do this. You can clearly see that this carbon now has one, two, three, four, five bonds. Broke the octet rule. That's why you can't oxidize tertiary alcohols, so your product looks just like that. So if you have a complete reaction question, just watch out. Make sure you oxidize everywhere. Don't miss a place. However, don't oxidize something that actually can't be oxidized. Okay, that's what you need to know about oxidation. So now I want to talk about the kind of, if that is heads on a coin, I want to talk about tails on a coin because we can talk about reduction. So, let's just say instead of ethanol now we have, let's actually just use a ketone. Let's say I wanted to go from a ketone to an alcohol, right? So because we're removing bonds to oxygen, we are now reducing. There's two sets of reagents you can use here. You need to know both of them. The first one would be if you use lithium aluminum hydride and a second step of acidic workup. This will accomplish the job. However, if you also have, I know people write this different ways. Some people write it with steps, some people don't. If you, uh, some people write ETOH, some people write CH3, CH2OH. I like writing ETOH because it's faster. So if you have lithium aluminum hydride and acidic workup, you can have this reduce. You can reduce a carbonyl to an alcohol. If you also have Sodium uh, boral hydride, NaBH4, and ethanol, that will also do the trick. The, the commonality here is that you have, you know, you see this atom, atom, H4. So whenever you see either of these two things, I want you all to think of H minus. Because that's what really is doing the reducing here. A really quick, like, mechanistic way to show this is you have H minus, right? Very small, very negative, very nucleophilic atom it likes this partially positive carbon right here, right? Big fat delta plus right here, and he sees that. He likes to come in and attack, and then we kick electrons up, right? So that gives us this right here. And then the H is now here. Not that I have to draw it, but that's where it ends up. That's, the H minus comes from both of these, and then what the H3O plus and what this functions in, in both scenarios is just a source to quench this negative charge, right? So if I just happen to use the ethanol here, the, H the O minus just grabs the H. 
we dump the electrons on that oxygen, and that is how we get our product, okay? What I will say is a, a way you can see, so you'll need this in synthesis for sure. However, how I've seen this be a, kind of like a tricky gotcha question on exams is the following. What if I gave you all, what if I just had a complete reaction question where we had cyclohexanone, cyclohexane with a ketone, and the complete reaction question was NABD4 and ethanol. Now here's the trick. If you're sitting at your computer, if you're nice enough to watch me today, and you're thinking, what the hell is that D? That is deuterium, that is hydrogen with two neutrons, right? The only reason why teachers in OCHEM will use deuterium is because we don't explicitly draw hydrogens, but if you have a deuterium, that is something you need to explicitly draw. So it kind of exposes, does this person really know the mechanism or something that they're actually working with right now? So following the same mechanism, right? We don't have H minus, we have D minus. So your D minus right here attacks the carbonyl carbon, right here, the very partial, partial positive carbonyl carbon is attacked by the D, uh, the D minus. Electrons kick up on your oxygen. So now in our second step of the mechanism, we see our O minus. However, now we see a deuterium right there. And then we have ethanol right here that quenches the positive, or sorry, the negative charge here. So I'll draw that step. O minus grabs the H, dump electrons onto that oxygen. So your final product would look like this, OH with a D right here. So that, so if you just drew the reduced alcohol, you'll get this wrong because if you don't draw the deuterium, the teacher's like, oh, well, I gotcha. I, they didn't realize that I was using deuterium because you can see this all the time. Instead of this setup, they'll use NaBH4 and ethanol with a deuterium. So make sure you know this mechanism. Make sure you spot any deuteriums because teachers will do this with this right here and they'll also do it with, they might give you lithium aluminum D4. So just be careful. I've seen that. That'd be a really lame way to lose some points because if you actually know what's going on. Okay, I think that's it for alcohols. I didn't have anything else. Yeah, okay. And we'll, we'll talk about the Grignard stuff when we do synthesis because I think it just fits better. Okay, so you know that stuff, you'll be good for complete the reaction things and synthesis things that will pop up on your final. Okay. Okie All right, so now we're going to be talking about um, alcohols, derivatives. So things like ethers, things like epoxides, things like carbocation shifts. So what I quickly want to first go over is anytime you have a carbocation, please make sure you look, can I improve this carbocation, right? Whether it be through a hydride shift or a methyl shift, okay? So I want to go through this one example, and then I want to talk about, because I think this example has a lot of good things packed in it, so we will do it, and then we will discuss. Okay, so let's say I have this, uh, this ring with a wedged methyl group and a wedged alcohol, and let's just say I expose it to HBr. So what will happen, right? What will go on here? So most of the time, this would be like a, here's this reaction, draw the mechanism, right? So never ever, if, especially if they give you the product and it looks like something completely different that you had no idea or expected to happen, never freak out. You can maybe freak out for a second, but that's as long as you're allowed to freak out. Because you, all the problems you'll see on your test, you have the tools to solve. So you should never think, well, I don't know how to do this, because you do. It's more about just picking out what, if you don't know exactly what's going on, picking out what you do know, starting somewhere, and eventually you'll have the light bulb moment and figure it out, okay? So, for here, what I'm thinking is, I have a st uh, strong acid, right? Something that is very good at protonating, out, like protonating things. And in the structure, I know I have an alcohol. More specifically, an alcohol has an oxygen, obviously, and oxygen really likes uh, it's very electronegative, it likes positive things. 
So this strong acid is going to propagate this alcohol, which is something we've definitely done before. So in the very first step of this mechanism, and in the interest of me saving space, I'm going to draw that. I will grab H+, and I will dump the electrons onto bromine. So I'm going to draw, kind of go down this way. Okay, we have a wedged methyl group. I still have the wedged, it's no longer an OH, right? It's going to be an OH2+, because now oxygen has a positive formal charge. Didn't touch these methyl groups over here whatsoever. Um, okay, and also as a side note, I didn't draw stereochemistry here because this is not a stereo center, right? I can just draw the methyl groups, you know, flat. Um, okay, now, right, this is a polar protic situation, right? I've now taken my OH, which was not a good leaving group, and now is a good leaving group. Seems like it would be a pretty good time to do solvolysis. So my leaving group leaves. Didn't touch these methyl groups over here. I have my wedge methyl group here. And looky, looky, I now have a carbocation. So anytime you form a positive charge, you have to stop. You have to think to yourself, can I make this better? Secondary, well, there's a secondary carbon here. However, there is a tertiary carb carbon hanging out next door. So what I can do is I can take the, the methyl, or sorry, the, uh, the hydrogen here, and I can do a hydride shift. Because what that allows me to do, didn't touch the methyl groups, that allows me to improve my carbocation from being secondary to now being tertiary. And, and remember, carbocations has, have sp2 hybridization, which means they have trigonal planar geometry. So my now previously wedged methyl group is planar, so it's just a straight line, okay? So we finally, you know, we did solvolysis, we finalized where our carbocation is located. Now I can bring back the bromine that has been oh so patiently waiting, very negatively uh, wanting to attack at this position, right? That makes sense. Just SN1. All we really did was have to evaluate where this carbocation was going. Now remember what I said. During SN1, because this is now trigonal planar and this is flat, this bromine has no preference whether it wants to do this or it wants to do this as it attacks, right? So it's going to do it in a 50-50 split. So to make sure you get full credit if this was a complete reaction or a mechanistic problem, right? I'm gonna to have to draw this bromine as wedge and a dashed methyl group, right? Because if the bromine attacks from the top, it'll force the methyl group down with my uh, two methyl groups there. I will also, have the enantiomer with bromine on as a dash and a wedge methyl group, right? So remember, this happens in a 50-50 split. And remember, this, when you have that 50-50 split, it's a racemic mixture. And remember, also with racemic mixtures, remember, if you have something, if something is chiral, it will rotate the plane of polarized light if light is flashed through a polarimeter and that substance. However, if you have a racemic mixture, right, this will, this will rotate the plane of polarized light. This will rotate the plane of polarized light. However, if you have them together, they, the whole mixture itself, the racemic mixture, does not rotate polar, plane polarized light. So remember that too. Okay, so what I think is interesting here, so this is our final product, and kind of a throwback to Gen Chem, is I think it's also very common for people to ask you to draw energy diagrams of kind of more like multi-step reactions. So let's do that real quick. We use pretty pink to make it extra fun. All right, so if I have energy on the y-axis, just whatever, reaction progress on the bottom. We know this reaction happens. We know that means, you know, it's exothermic, right? Clearly nature will not have something go towards something else if it is energetically unfavorable. So, let's just say we start up here, and we end down here. I'll call this product A and product B, because I don't feel like drawing them out again. We'll do A plus B. And I'll draw our little guy up here. All right. Right? This is what we got. So, actually, I'm going to draw this a little bit lower and give myself any room up top. 
Sorry, a little messy, that's okay. Okay, so this first step, a protonation step, right? We're going from a neutral species to a slight, to a charged species, right? So that's going to involve a little bit of an energy bump up because something that's neutral is more stable than something that is charged, right? As far as its energy. So we'll just have a little activation energy. We'll finish just a little bit higher than we started. I'll call this one. So I can just put a one here. Structure one, just a little higher energy than where we started. It's always about playing this game of like, did you get higher energy or did you get lower energy? So right here, solvolysis. We're having a, we're literally having something leave and then we're forming a carbocation. This is an intermediate, this is unstable. So this, we're gonna gain even more energy. It doesn't matter how much you show, it's just that you show the relative amounts between the intermediates. Okay, now what I think this part's interesting. We go from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. Yes, they're both charged. Yes, they're both unstable. However, intermediate three is more stable than intermediate two. That's why we relocated the charge, right? So we'll have an energy dip. Whoops, not. I'm no artist, by the way, so sorry. My bumps are not good. But do you see, three is lower than two, all right? And then we actually have the attack. That's the energy giving off step. So I'm really just connecting the dots here. So, I, and it doesn't matter, you know, how high your activation energies are. What, what, if someone was giving you this problem, what they're looking for is, did it increase energy from the protonation step? So if all this happens, did that increase energy of the intermediate? Did the relocation of the carbocation give off energy? And then did the final step give off energy? Okay. So you will have a relocation. You will have to do a shift on your final, no doubt. So whether if it's a methyl shift or a um, hydride shift, be ready for that. Um, okay. I think we'll keep going. I'm realizing that we are definitely, I'm definitely going to have to have this run a little bit longer because I'm not even close to where I want to be as far as how much stuff I want to cover. It's my fault for not being realistic. Okay, so I want to talk about epoxides real quick. So remember, an epoxide is where you have um, two carbons, this kind of three atom spring structure, right? It's a carbon, a carbon bonded to an oxygen. So you could also draw it like this, right? So there's two ways to attack epoxides. And by regiochemistry, I mean, there's two scenarios where, in which, where you attack the epoxide varies, your region of where the chemistry occurs. So let's just say I gave conditions like this first. CH3OH and H2SO4. I gave some acidic conditions. What happens first is you protonate your oxygen, right? And then your nucleophile, which in this situation, right, this is your acid, this is your nucleophile, the CH3OH. Basically, when you have a, an acidic condition, you want to attack the more substituted carbon because when you have this positive charge, you can draw resonance, and your two resonance structures looks like this, and like this. Uh, da -da -da. So, given these two resonance structures in an acidic scenario, you can see that this is a better resonance structure, right? This carbon up top, and it's more substituted. Therefore, since it is a more stable resonance structure because this is a better cation than this, it contributes more to the overall resonance hybrid, which means it looks like this structure more of the time, which means this struct, this position right here in an acidic environment has a greater delta plus on it, right? Which means it is more susceptible for something negative, a nucleophile, yeah, a negative nucleophile to attack it. So, in an acidic environment, that was the long-winded way of saying we attack the more substituted carbon. So that would be, we would attack here, electrons kick here, which my OH ends up as a wedge over here. And at this position, right, we have to come from the back side. This is a wedge right here, right here. However, 
we d I do know that there's this downward facing methyl group. So, but we have to come from the backside. That this is an SN2 attack. So, this methyl group flips up to be a wedge, and we have a dashed um, OCH3, and it still has that right here. That's where we attach as a dash, and we have a plus charge here. And I'm not going to show this, but this H will just fall off. So, this will be your final product right there. And you can even just draw it like this. Like that. Okay? So, if we're, this is, happens if we're an acid. Attack more substituted carbon. So, now, for basic, it's the opposite. We have no protonation step. We don't draw resonance. If I give you guys the same problem. Shoot, did not draw that well. Same problem like this. There we go. So, you know it's a, an acidic environment if you see some form of acid or some plus charge or something like that. Because you could even, instead of this H2SO4, you could have seen, I could have shown you guys something like this. You see some positive, positivity. However, you know it's basic if you see some negative charge. Like if I just decided to, to draw this for the epoxide, like that. Grignards are negative, right? When you see a Grignard, right, something bonded to an MGBR, you know that this piece attached has a negative charge. Grignards are great nucleophiles. They're super negative. They're great bases, great nukes. So, there's no positive charges, there's no protonation. When you have a basic environment with epoxides, you're looking for where is the easiest place to attack. So that kind of aligns with your regular SN2 mentality. So, right here, this Grignard will just, this position is more, you know, less sterically hindered. It attacks here, electrons kick here. You have an O minus. Your Grignard attaches, since the epoxide was wedged here, it will, this ethanol, or sorry, this ethyl will attach as a dash. This oxygen will get, maybe you have like a first step of this and then a second step of some type of like water. It will just quench your negative charge here. So your final product looks like, oops, looks like this. So remember, take on point with epoxides. Acidic environment, because of the resonance and what we discussed, you attack the more substituted carbon, always. Basic, it's the opposite. You attack the more sterically available carbon, the easier place to attack. Okay? All right. So, that's that with epoxides. Really quickly, I want to talk about ethers. What's nice is that ethers are very, very simple, and you'll probably see a question on your final about them, which is super nice. Specifically, there's a type of ether formation called uh, Williamson ether synthesis. It's super, super simple. Super, super easy. Basically, here's how you form an ether. You need some type of negative oxygen and something easy to attack. So, this, so what I'll show you is just the more generic. This is the non-Williamson ether way to do this. And I'll show you the Williams in either way. They're basically the same. So, we know ox alcohols, right? The oxygen is negative, can grab protons. But alcohols can also donate their H plus as well if you introduce a strong base. So let's just say I threw in some LDA here. And this is not the proper way to draw it. But LDA will basically just rip this H off of the oxygen like this. So, it's a great way to just get an O minus like this. You now have a good nucleophile, right? This was pretty mediocre, but now this oxygen is ready to attack something positive. So if I just throw in something, you know, like propyl bromide, this oxygen is going to attack the substrate, dump the electrons onto the leaving group, and we basically just made, here's the two carbons I had before, my oxygen, and now I have one, two, three more carbons. There you go. That's the generic way to form an ether, right? Just make, get an alcohol, deprotonate it, 
and then now that it's negative, it can attack anything with a good leaving group. The only difference with Williamson Ether is that instead of doing this with some type of base, like I could have used NH2 minus here, whatever. The only difference here would be you use elemental sodium. Right, you might see this little circle up top just to show that it's elemental. But basically this right here, and you don't have to show this mechanistically, this will accomplish the deprotonation of your oxygen. So then you can just throw in some type of something with a good leaving group. Have it attack. I'm going to draw this with the benzene ring over here too. Right, this was my carbon right here. And then just an oxygen. There you go. So that is the Williamson ether synthesis, this right here, using sodium. This right here would just be a more generic ether approach, like ether formation approach. However, they're basically the same, okay? All right. Um, we got lots to do, and I have so much more that I wanted to do with this stuff, but I do not just have the time because we are going to spend some time on alkenes and alkynes. Um, do, do, do. All right, so I do want to go over one more ether thing and then we'll, we'll move on to alkenes. A very common question I've seen a bunch of times on tests, and maybe you've already had this on a previous exam. I hope not because I want to show you guys new stuff that might come up. Is if you had a very similar type of like two ether, two ether formation problems like, like this. which this would give us this product. Yeah, this is the one I drew before. And then something like this. Someone might give you two reactions and say, reaction one and reaction two are done in a lab it is observed that reaction two is much faster and more energetically favorable than reaction one. Not your job to confirm that they're telling you that. So they would just be like, why is that the case between these two ether formation products, right? And you can see that this is both Williamson ether, right? However, um, basically it comes down to this. This reaction one requires two reactants and gives us one product. However, reaction two we have our nucleophile and leaving group packaged into one molecule. So we're going from one reactant to one product, right? And if we throw it back to Gen Chem, right, you see this stuff is still coming back, is that we're, this up here, this is a more disordered system moving to more order. This system is staying the same. So if we're going to talk about entropy, good old delta S, remember, we like to move to more disorder, more, fewer reactants to more products that are bumping into each other. So... If you had to answer this problem, you could just say um, the entropy of reaction two is better than reaction one because it's a one to one, one, one to one reactant to product versus reactant one, which is two reactants to one product. So that's, you might see it. If you do see it, then you already know the answer. Okay, and I do actually want to talk about one, I keep thinking of things, one more thing that's very important with ethers. And this is kind of wrapped in with Grignards and stuff. Okay. So, one thing you might also have to do, so I showed you kind of like the basic way to form ethers, and by basic I mean with negative charges. However, what you can also do, let's just say I gave uh, like this problem right here, actually it doesn't even need to be one, two, but let's just say I gave H2SO4 and uh, I don't know, ethanol. Right? So what would happen here, right? We know alcohols can donate H plus as well as accept it. Um, so in this very first step, this OH will be protonated to OH2 plus. And now solvolysis won't happen because this is primary, right? We won't, we won't form a primary carbocation. However, although ethanol is not a great nucleophile, as soon as we protonate this water, this ethanol is now good enough to do SN2. So you can have a type of ether formation, right? We have two carbons.
and this is, I don't know, this is ethanol. I mean, we have diethyl ether, but I just want to show you that you can do this in acidic conditions as well, where you just need to protonate, you just need a some type of acid to protonate your alcohol and then another alcohol to throw into the mix. Um, and what you can also do is not only does this go forwards, but this can also go backwards. So if we even go down here, let's just say I had the diethyl ether and I just toss in H2SO4 and water. You can have this get protonated. And then water can go ahead and attack. So you can undo your ether as well. And this will come in handy in a synthesis problem that we will do later. Okay? So just keep that tucked in the back of your mind. Sorry, if I'm a little all over the place, it's just because I just want to make sure I fit everything in. Okay, so that's it for kind of ethers for now. Now I want to move into alkenes, which is a lot of information here. So this will also lay the ground for alkynes as well. Um, so, right, what I want to talk about first, just a quick physical property thing. Remember, with double bonds, right here and here. If we want to talk about hybridization, one, two, three bonding areas, this carbon is sp2 hybridized, this carbon is also sp2 hybridized, and because of that, this double bond, right, it consists of a sigma bond with an sp2, sp2 orbital overlap, and then because uh, we have that leftover p orbital for both of these guys, I'm going to draw them over here, right, these, that's sp2, this is sp2, we have a p orbital right here, right, that leftover p orbital, and the, this is the sigma bond, the head-to-head -head overlap, and this is the pi bond right here. So, remember, with a pi bond, the p orbitals have to stay parallel to each other, aka they can't twist like this. They need to stay um, in line with each other. So, what that means is there's no free rotation about this double bond. So, remember, if we look at this double bond, and we kind of draw a dotted line across it, and then we walk it, Right? Since we cross the dotted line, remember this is a trans double bond. And if I drew the other type of double bond, right, I draw my dotted line. This, if I walk the double bond, I don't cross the dotted line. That's a cis double bond. Right? So, two types. And a quick physical property thing about these two. A common question you might, you might see, potentially is who has a higher boiling point? Um, two cis butene, cis, cis two butene, or trans two butene? And the answer is just by like, I think half a degree. It's actually cis two butene because, because these group, these methyl groups are locked into the way that they're locked there's more, there's literally more negative charge on this half of the structure than on this half right here, right? So there's a slight dipole effect. This half is slightly more negative. This half is slightly more positive. With trans 2 butene, there's none of that, right? They just have dispersion intermolecular forces going for them. Like intermolecular forces, intermolecular forces, and this slight dipole effect. So because this structure has stronger intermolecular forces, it has a higher, slightly higher boiling point. That might be the one physical property question you might get asked. Okay, so enough of that. Let's start talking about reactions because there's, there's a couple of them in here, but we'll go through them and we'll pick them apart. Okay, so the first one you could get asked, and I do have a study guide on Joachim uh, that lists all of these out with all the things we're about to talk about. Let's just say we had this structure and we had this is called hydrogenation we expose some h2pdc here so remember what's going to happen is we're going to hydrogenate this double bond we're going to put a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here and replace the double bond however 
remember, there's gonna the, the hydrogens are going to add in a particular way. So this is called a syn addition, S-Y-N, which means same side. So it doesn't matter which side you put them on because it'll happen in a 50-50 split, but the hydrogens you put on have to be on the same side of the ring. Whoops. So I'm just gonna choose wedges. So if you put your hydrogens on as wedges, make sure you draw your methyl groups as dashed. So you'll have this product as well as uh, this product. Okay, just make sure it's a sin addition. Um, a problem I've seen before is something like this. Deuterium PDC, right? Because remember, pesky deuterium can come back, right? Um, so it's like a T, actually something, something like this, whatever. It's the point being, you have some, you're gonna hydrogenate this double bond. However, this ring has these two really big bulky T butyl groups on top of it. So we know these deuteriums have to add to the same side of the ring. And I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say the top of this ring is guarded. It's, it's sterically hindered by these big bulky T butyl groups. So the answer that you would hopefully see is that if these deuteriums, right, they have the choice to be on whichever side of the ring they choose, but they're both going to be on the same side, I would definitely insert them on the underside of this ring. They will add as two dashes, not two wedges, because the T-butyl groups are providing some steric hindrance, if that makes sense. Okay? So that's hydrogenation. That's the first reaction for alkenes. That's an easy one. I hope uh, that is familiar to you. All right, so then the next one is we're gonna do Markovnikov addition of some things. This is the big theme for alkenes. Okay, so if we look at something like this, remember, uh, let's just say we'll, we'll do a binary acid first. So let's just say it's something like HBr. You can do this with HCl, HBr, HI, there's twice as much negative charge in this double bond as just a regular bond. We have a strong protic acid here. We have H, HBr. So we can protonate this double bond. So when you protonate this double bond, one of these carbons is going to bond to hydrogen. One of them is going to lose a bond. You want to form the most stable carbocation always. So I don't want to form this primary one. I want to form a secondary carbocation. Then, once you've done that, you produce a good nucleophile. So your good nucleophile comes in and attacks. And throwback to our substitution elimination chapter, because this is an sp2 uh, hybridized carbon, because it's a carbocation, if stereochemistry is relevant, remember this will form a racemic mixture because it's flat, bromine attacks here, bromine attacks here. Okay, so let's do a more involved example because since there's carbocations, right, there can be shifts. Let's draw something like so I draw HI. Oh, I completely did that wrong. Right here. There we go. Okay, so protonate the double bond with this H plus. So I need to figure out where my carbocation is gonna be. Do I want to form a primary one or a secondary one? I hopefully think you're sitting at your computer. Saying secondary. Now stop and think to yourself, can I improve this carbocation? Obviously the answer is yes. I want to move the secondary carbocation. I see this quaternary carbocation, or sorry, quaternary carbon next door. No hydrogens to move, but we can do a methyl shift. So I'm going to literally point my arrow at this methyl group and move it all the way over here. So I have this methyl group left over here. I move this methyl group over here, and you can see that this position now lost a bond. He bears the new positive charge. I now have iodine come in, attack, and there's my product there. So be aware of the fact that with Markovnikov additions, aka a mechanism that involves carbocations, carbocation intermediates, be wary of shifts.
What's nice is if you just got this, the next couple of reactions we're gonna look at and review, basically the same. Okay. So you can do more carbon to carbon additions with halogens, but you can also do them with water. So basically you just throw in H2O and H2SO4. Your acid is what will protonate the double bond. If I protonate this double bond, just crudely gonna just very simply draw the protonation. I have to choose primary or secondary. Secondary is the more stable double uh, carbocation formation position. Then you bring in your nucleophile, water attacks. That's where you would attach the OH plus. And then something's gonna come along and clean him up to just bring him back to an alcohol. Could be this, could be this, whatever. So, let's do a quick example because I think examples really make it apparent. Uh, let's draw it down here. Um, and I hope you'll see it's very similar to the one we just did. H2O, H2SO4. Okay, I see acid, I see a very negative double bond. And it gets protonated. The intermediate that I form, I have my choice of here and here. And they're both secondary. However, I hope you know that they're not equal secondary positions because if I pick this secondary position, I, even, even though they're seemingly the same stability, putting my carbocation here allows me to have the tertiary next door to then do a hydride shift. So that's the carbocation I'm gonna rock with. And then I hope you see that water attacks and the product we get is this because water will attach at that position okay all right so we're just gonna keep chugging along because we haven't even gotten to the cool synthesis stuff yet okay all right let me see what's next real quick do 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 What we can do next is you can have this reaction, uh, either Br2 or this works with Cl2 and uh, this solvent. You can take either Br2 or Cl2 and you can insert it across a double bond. However, right, we need to think about how they, this works out stereochemically. And here's what you get, actually. You insert the halogen across the double bond, but it's not on the same side of the ring, right? It's not what we were calling a syn addition, S-Y-N. They're on opposite sides of the ring. And then this is called an anti-addition. Anti just meaning opposite sides um, of the double bond, of the ring, wherever. Like, stereochemically, they will be, one will be up, one will be down, okay? So let me show you this mechanism real quick. Uh, and then I probably won't show mechanisms. Actually, I, I can't say that for sure. We'll just do the mechanism. Okay. So very first thing that's going to happen is the double bond. Different people draw this first step differently, but it's easiest to just show the double bond grabbing one bromine and giving the other bromine the other electrons. So very much like an epoxide, you form this cyclic thing right here. It's actually called a... It's either called a cyclic bromonium ion or a cyclic chloronium ion, if you're looking for big words to sound smart. So, you get this little epoxide thingy. And the best way for, at least I think so, to think about this is it's like an epoxy. I'm going to actually uh, have this at that. It's like an epoxide in acidic... Uh, actually, I'm going to remove that. Just kidding. Just kidding. But you need to think of this as like an epoxide in acidic conditions. Because there's positive charges, that's why you can make the acidic analogy. Um, you can basically draw resonance with the structure. So we could draw this looking like this, oops, like this. And we can draw this looking like this. The point being is that you see 
carbons in this cyclic structure that have po that bear positive charges, aka we can see a nucleophile attack happening here, nucleophilic attack rather. So we made a Br- minus in that first step, so we're just going to attack and break the ring. And you can see that's why it's an anti-addition, right? Because we have this cyclic three atom structure here, right? It's gonna be either two wedges or it'll be two dashes. Right, they have to be on the same side of the ring. So when attack happens, wherever this three-membered ring is, right, the nucleophile is gonna come from the other side. That's why it adds oppositely, right? That's how we get this. So the reason why this is important, right? I gave you a symmetric, like a, uh, a symmetric situation right here, right? What if I didn't? What if I was mean and I gave you a scenario, I'm gonna use blue, and I gave you a scenario like this. Um, not much different. Just something like this, right? Br, actually we'll use chlorine this time. We'll show chlorine some love. Cl2, CCl4. This is just the solvent. So, my advice to you, and I'll draw the kind of mechanism again, you also need to, you always need to think about the intermediate. Negative double bond, grabs a halogen. This time I'll draw the cyclic thing underneath the ring. Right, this is our intermediate, right? So, we can think of this as an epoxide in acidic conditions because Right on this structure right here, I need to think about my resonance that I can draw. And I can draw this ring like this. Uh, like putting the carbocation here, as well as putting, uh, giving, putting the chlorine over here and having my carbocation here. So you see in the two resonance scenarios, I have a secondary carbocation or I have a tertiary carbocation. This is the more stable resonance structure. This structure contributes more to the overall hybrid. It looks like this structure more of the time. So in this intermediate, this carbon right here has the bigger delta plus, which means something that's negative is gonna be drawn more to this position, right? The exact same explanation for how we figure out where to attack with epoxides in acidic conditions. So, the Cl minus I kicked back a while ago. He's going to attack here. Which means I'm gonna have my chlorine over here. And that means I'm coming from, the since my leaving group right here is a dash, I need to attack and attach this chlorine as a wedge which means my pre-existing wedge methyl group flips down to a dash, okay? So that's, uh, that's what you need to think of when this happens. However, there's even one more layer to this. Nothing new, just a little extra twist. And I'm gonna leave our work down there up because this is gonna help us out. Okay, so someone can also be even a little extra you know, sneaky, and give you a scenario like, here, we'll just do ethyl down here. They can do something like this. They can give you Br2, and instead of this CCl4 or CBr4, which doesn't do anything, it doesn't participate in the reaction, they can give you something like water, and you'll see that this does participate in the reaction. So we know the first step of this mechanism is double bond, grabs halogen, we form our cyclic ion. Draw it real quick. Right? Now, there is so much more. For the very, until A bromine is grabbed, that's when we produce a Br. However, this bromi bromide ion is outnumbered heavily by all the solvent water that's around. So, when this thing is ready to be attacked, the water or whatever solvent you have, it could be like methanol or something, completely puts this guy to shame and he steps in for the attack. So, remember, we know we're attacking the more substituted carbon. We're attacking here. So I know my bromine ends up as a wedge. My water, which is going to be an OH at the end, he comes from the dashed side because the leaving group was a wedge. 
and uh, the previously existing ethanol, ethyl group flips up to be a wedge. So just remember, it's very, with these problems, form your cyclic ion. Or if you don't need to, and you're a baller, that's totally cool. Um, but go ahead and form your cyclic ion, and then if you have a solvent that's going to participate in your reaction, then you need to, um, you need to absolutely attack the more substituted carbon. One second. Um, okay, so, sorry about that. Uh, la, la, la. Okay, so, let's keep rocking. Um, from here forward, there's like one more big mechanism with alkenes that I want to cover, but other than that, we're just going to kind of draw reactions and talk about them. Okay, so, what are we doing now? One sec, let me look at my handy dandy book. Ba -ba -dum. Alrighty. Okay, so we had talked about a Markovnikov addition of water, right? Actually, let me draw it like this. We talked about a Markovnikov addition of water. So if I drew this scenario right here, right, I know I would form a carbocation. Whoops you know, my stable one, which would be at this position. And unfortunately, whether I would want this or not, it would relocate to this position, and then I would form my alcohol. Okay? However, what if I wanted this product? What if I did not want the relocation of my alcohol? Well, luckily, there are reagents for that, because sometimes maybe you'd want this in a certain position for synthesis, whatever, whatever need you might have. So, what you can do, and these reagents are wacky, I always, always, always forget them. I have to look them up all the time, and which means I have them literally written over here for me to write. If you want to do a straight up addition of water without rearrangements, and I'm going to very, very, very grossly abbreviate, um, you can use these following reagents. They are... Mercuric acetate, which is a mouthful, and that's the most important part, but it's the first step of mercuric ac uh, acetate. If you can remember the water, that's good. And follow it up with a reductive step. I say reductive, right, because NaBH4 is our, our reducing agent or something that helps us reduce. Um, this combination of reagents, you can fully, 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 it doesn't go through a carbocation intermediate. You can just fully, fully, fully be confident that you can. Don't think about rearrangements, but you can just say, this is the more substituted carbon, that's where I want my OH to go, and bam, that's where it does go, okay? There is a little bit of like extra stereochemistry involved with this. It really depends on your teacher if you need to know it, but more often than not, you don't need to know the stereochemistry aspect of it. You just need to know regiochemically, you know, am I putting my OH here or here? More substituted position, that's all I'm gonna go with because we have more stuff to do. This is a really big one. The fancy name for this reaction is called oxymercuration, demercuration. And of course, I'm just writing this and I'm just going to erase it right after. But it's because there's mercury involved. You don't see mercury too often in OCHEM. Okay? So that's one more reaction in here. Another one you can do involving another addition of water. Keep this here to kind of highlight the differences. Let's say we had the same structure, and I instead wanted not the Markovnikov product, right, with the more substituted alcohol product. Maybe I wanted the, like, you know, the opposite of that. Um, and when I say that, I can call this anti, the anti-Markovnikov. Not anti-addition as far as, like, opposite sides stereochemistry-wise, but I'm talking about the, op the typically expected opposite Markovnikov product. This... Again, these are some wacky, wacky reagents, but you would need BH3, you need some, uh, a boron type substance, and then boron and a peroxide. That'll, that'll really, whenever you see boron and a peroxide, which we will one more time, that usually means 
we're going to do the opposite, uh, the less substituted addition. Again, just like this, there is some stereochemistry that you might need to like know about. It depends on your teacher. It's, it's very, it's more unlikely than likely, which is why I'm not going to, you know, talk about it. But if you want an addition of water with no rearrangements in the more substituted position, you need to break out your oxymercuration, demercuration. It's just a straight up addition. If you want, again, no rearrangements, but the least substituted position, go with your anti markovnikov addition of water. That involves uh, BH3. This is called hydroboration, which makes total sense because you're kind of hydrating the structure with an OH and you're using boron. Okay. Again, these are all outlined in this, the study guide I have on geochem. It's under the alkene section. Okay. Only a few more before we get to do some synthesis stuff and some NMR stuff. So if that's what you're excited about, just hold that excitement. Okie dokie. All right. So another kind of just remember this reaction. So we talked about attacking epoxides, but what's nice is that with a double bond, if you throw in a substance called MCB, MCPBA, which is metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, luckily you just need to know MCPBA, it basically takes your carbons in your double bond, whatever it might be, and uh, it just makes an epoxide out of it. So whether it be that or whether it be something like this, MCPBA, There you go. So, you could see this in a complete reaction question. You might need it in a synthesis problem. This is how you make epoxides. Okay. All right. We got a few more before we move on to alkynes. Okay. So, this next reaction, it, uh, doo -doo -doo. so I'm actually going to use, bring back a familiar friend. Just easy to show stereochemistry with this guy. He's not my favorite. Anyways, if you have some type of structure with a double bond, right, because we're talking about alkenes, and you throw in osmium tetroxide, the only time you'll probably use osmium in your entire life, and a workup of H2S, what you do is you take your two carbons in the double bond, and you insert two alcohols on those carbons, and... There is some stereochemistry involved, which is why I chose to use this, use this ring. So very much like the hydrogenation reaction, this reaction right here, it, uh, we're adding stuff on the same side of the ring. So this is actually a 50-50 yield of wedges and dashes. This will be a syn addition, right? So same side. Remember, anti-opposite side. That was what we saw with adding our dihalide, right, with something like this. This was anti, this is sin, okay? Some people require a mechanism for this. I've only ran into it, like, like some teachers don't. I hope I'm not just making, you know, generalizations and everyone needs to know this, but typically it's a good complete the reaction question um, just to see if you know if it's a sin addition. I have seen it pop up in synthesis before being useful. Just know that it's a syn addition and that you put two OHs across your double bond. Um, when you have two things next door to each other like this, the same, some people will break out this term. This means vicinal, like you have vicinal diol. Two alcohols next door to each other. Um, that's just, you know, for fun. Something for you to whip out on a Friday or Saturday night to impress somebody. Okay, so that's what you need to know there. Uh, okay, so two more reactions and then alkenes, or sorry, alkynes rather. All right, so this next reaction, a very good complete the reaction question, it's called ozonolysis. Uh, I know there's a couple of different variations of the reagents, but I'm just going to just do one set. If you see ozone, it's pretty obvious what this reaction is. It's like a first step of ozone, and there's a lot of other supporting reagents, but ozone is the most important, and then you'll also see zinc. So if you see ozone and zinc, I'm leaving some other things out, 
but these are the these are the key players in this reaction. Here's what you do. You're literally going to cleave your double bond. You literally, um, I've heard it, you, you take out your molecular scissors and you just snip, cut your double bond in half. So you're literally going to produce two different pieces of what you previously had. And whatever carbon was previously involved in your double bond, it's now a carbonyl. So this produces aldehydes and ketones. So right here you can see I have two of these. Two, two carbon aldehydes. So a really cool, not a cool problem, because is any of this really cool? That's a trick question, the answer is yes. Uh, what I like is this problem right here. Uh, is that it? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so if you want to do ozonolysis here, right, we have a ring, and I'm gonna make my molecular chop right here, okay? I would highly recommend when you do rings, or I don't know, if you, if you think anything I'm saying is helpful, I usually like to number, which I know is annoying, but it's foolproof. So what happens here is that I'm going to take this, what once was a ring, and I'm gonna have just seven carbons in a row. Okay, so I can see carbons two and seven were the ones involved in the double bond. So now I'm gonna have a ketone on two, ketone on two, and a carbonyl on seven, and since it's, that's on the end, it's an aldehyde. So you'll typically see this on a complete the reaction question. Someone's super mean, they'll make you use it in a synthesis question, which we're gonna do one that's gonna involve this. Uh, but yeah, it's breaking, we're breaking bonds here. Okay, so last reaction here, and a mechanism, and then on to alkynes. Okay. This one is going to be the anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. Okay, so previously, we talked about how to do an anti-Markovnikov addition of water, where you put the OH on the least substituted carbon. So you can do this with a halogen. However, you can only do this, only do this with HBr. You cannot do this with HCl. You cannot do this with HI. No, this is only HBr. It's time to shine. So if you had this reaction right here, and you used HBr, and you just need a, a peroxide. Typically, people use hydrogen peroxide. Those are your reagents. You put your bromine on the least substituted carbon. So here it would be there. Um, so I want to show this mechanism because it's a very, it's a very uh, popular one since it's at the end of whatever you're learning. It's I've seen it on tests a bunch, um, and it's the only other radical mechanism you learn in OCHEM. So yeah, if you if you watch the Joe Kim videos, free radical chain reactions is the first one, and this is the second one uh, in OCHEM one. So here's how we do this. Some people will let you skip this initiation step, but I'm going to give you guys the whole enchilada. High oxygen oxygen bonds are famously weak; they split very easily. So what happens is there's homolytic cleavage, right? This bond is going to split, and one oxygen gets one electron, the other oxygen gets another electron. So this is the step people let you typically skip, but I like to show it because it shows where you get your first radical like species, right? So that's how we get a radical right there. We have that lone electron sitting on that oxygen, unpaired rather. So then what's gonna happen next? HBr run, runs into, I'm gonna draw this differently. Uh, doo -doo -doo. The radical oxygen runs into HBr. Radicals are very unstable. This radical electron is trying to figure out any way to not be a radical anymore. He's going to then pluck the hydrogen. Hydrogen takes one electron from this bond and pair up with this right here. So this HO is going to become water. And then the other bond, right, because this bond has two electrons, goes to bromine. So it doesn't really matter. This doesn't really matter. We have H2O. But more importantly, we produce a radical bromine. Very important. So enter in our, reag our reactant right here. The radical bromine shows up, also very reactive, right? 
Doesn't matter where the radical is, they're super reactive. All right, so this bromine is going to link up with one electron from this bond. So now we have a choice, right? I showed one of these, one of the electrons in this bond going with the bromine. So now I need to create a radical on this structure. So I have a choice. I can give the extra electron to this carbon or this carbon. And just like carbocation stability, radical stability is the exact same. I want to produce the more substituted radical because that will be more stable. So I give the radical electron to the secondary carbon as opposed to the primary. And now I think you can see how this works because now my bromine is in the least substituted position and my radical is on the more substituted carbon. So what's nice about this reaction, what I always see as a follow-up question, is the last step here is you, end, you bring in another HBr. This radical carbon snatches a per, uh, you know, the hydrogen right here, and then you actually produce, that's right, another radical bromine. So you have your product, whoop, and then you produce this. So just like in the beginning of our OCHEM careers, where we had a chain reaction. This is also a chain reaction. By the nature of it doing itself, it then produces what it needs to keep going, right? Because the bromine, radical bromine is produced at the end, and it just goes right back over here and runs into another reactant. That's why this question, I think, is so you know, uh, frequently used on finals, because it has all these ideas from the past, as well as you know the new idea of, in this mechanism, you put the bromine on the least substituted position to then form the more stable radical on your reactant, okay? So that is it for alkenes. So let me just get, uh, let me just get this erased. We'll talk about alkynes. We'll do some problems. We're definitely gonna go a smidge after three for sure. And, uh, That'll, uh, yeah, we'll just keep going, we'll keep rocking. Okay, so with alkynes. A lot of similarities to alkene because really we just, it's all about having more electron density, more bonds between carbons. So let's talk about hydrogenation real quick. Because you'll see, this, these are definitely easy gimme problems to have on your test. Okay. So, we have a triple bond. So here's a four, here's a four carbon alkyne. Be careful when you draw alkynes. Remember, their right here, their uh, hybridization is sp, which means they have a linear geometry. If you do this on your final, whatever your problem is, your teacher's going to mark it straight up wrong because this is not how they look. You need to actually show the linear. Um, properties of alkynes. So this is bad. Don't do this. Okay. So, if you want to hydrogenate, if you want to, uh, we can do three types of hydrogenation. If you want to go straight to the, alke uh, the alkane, right, you need two equivalents of a reagent we've seen before, the H2PDC, because there's literally twice as many, there's two pi bonds here you need to hydrogenate. So you need two equivalents, or just an excess. However, we can actually do two different types of hydrogenations here. We can get the trans double bond if we just want to do one step of hydrogenation, and we can do the cis, right? So the reagents up here are liquid ammonia and sodium, and then down here, something called Lindler's and H2. Some people refer to this as the poison catalyst. Just be aware of that. Some teachers require you to know what this, the Lindler's catalyst, Lindler's catalyst in, uh, entails. I hope that's not you because that sucks, but that's life. Okay, so just know this. This is a way to uh, get different types of double bonds from an alkyne. Okay, so we're going to talk about one, mm, one thing that should be familiar. I'm actually going to bring back the same alkyne. So, if we did HCl here, if we did a Markovnikov addition of HCl to this, this behaves no differently than the alkenes we were just talking about. You're going to protonate the triple bond. You're going to dump electrons on there. 
we would now have this, right? Because these are both secondary, so it doesn't matter which carbocation I form. Then Cl minus comes in and attacks. There we go. So that is, you would just do your Markovnikov addition as you typically would. If you have an excess of HCl, you get the full product like this, right? When you have two things on the same carbon here, it's not a vicinal, because vicinal meant next door, this is actually geminal. Again, useless trivia, but there you go. Okay. So this is less kind of interesting. It, it's something that should make sense. You probably already know it. Um, what's more interesting, I think, with alkynes is if you get into a situation, uh, this type of hydration, if you do any more common combinations of water with them because what happens here is, let's do this. Now, the sets of reagents look different, but it's just a Markovnikov addition of water. You have this HgSO4, this mercuric sulfate. However, you're just going to have, you know, acid and water. So here's basically what happens. You're going to protonate your triple bond, right? So there's H plus somewhere. Triple bond finds it. One, two, three, four. You're going to form your carbocation here. Water, your nucleophile, comes in and attacks. I'm sure you've seen this before. This is something teachers like to co uh, cover at the end of OCHEM 1. This right here we just formed is an enol because the en is the part of the alk it signifies the alkene part of the structure. The ol signifies the alcohol part of the structure. So, ketones and enols are in a constant equilibrium with each other. And they vary, this equilibrium heavily favors ketones. This is called ketoenol tautomerism. I might spell this wrong, so I apologize if I do. This is something, if I have enough time, I'll show you the little switching back and forth. Just know that they're in an equilibrium. It's heavily favored on the keto side. And it's because of the fact that a uh, carbon-oxygen double bond is stronger than a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, like the, the types of bonds in the ketone are more energetically favorable than the ones in the, the enol. So this is why the equilibrium is favored. So as soon as you reach this enol intermediate in the hydration of this triple bond, it flips to a ketone. The only reason I brought that up is to show you how this mechanism goes. Okay? So that's why when you hydrate a triple bond, you end up with a carbonyl. It's not like, whoa, like where the hell did that come from? That's kind of the origin of where it, it comes from. So if I just draw a line right here. So if we do another example. And I again have my mercuric sulfate, H2SO4, and water. I can see this is my more substituted position, right? Because it's just like a Markovnikov addition of water, right? So you just know my OH attaches here, but then it's a part of an enol. Which then flips to a ketone, okay? So if you were wondering, Oh, well, if there's a Markovnikov addition of water for triple bonds, is there an anti-Markovnikov uh, addition of water to a triple bond? Then you're absolutely right. If you use slightly different reagents that are very similar to the ones you use for double bonds, and I have to look it up again because I don't remember. They are. Some people use R, but I use BH3. And it's very, very similar reagents to what you would actually maybe even the same as a uh, double bond. But here, you then go with the less substituted position. Still goes through like roughly, roughly the same mechanism. But you can see this would be the Markovnikov addition of water to a triple bond and the exact same triple bond, but it's the anti-Markovnikov addition. So be on the lookout for this on the complete the reaction section, maybe for synthesis. But as far as 
that stuff goes as far as like all the chapters. I think that's all I really wanted. So that's what I wanted to cover. But now, now, we're going to do some synthesis problems. So sorry if that was a bit preachy. Sorry if I was just kind of talking at you. Um, but I just wanted to make sure we kind of at least covered everything. So if you want to go back, talk to look at a section, you can at least do that. Because once this video is made available to me by Facebook, I am going to put it on Jokem. Okay. So let's do some synthesis. Because this is what it's all about. This is why, this is why we're here. Okay. So I have a couple problems that I want to go. These are kind of like mini ones, and then we're going to do a bigger one. Okay. So. Like I said, mini ones first, and then we go with the big boy. Okay. So. We need to get two deuteriums on the same side of the ring from this plain old cyclopentane. So it's always easiest to start from the end and go to the beginning. But how, like on, on these smaller ones, if you see it from the beginning, go ahead. Don't let me stop you. Go ahead and go forward. Okay. So what I what we can do is taking this one step back. It is very clear from here, right? We have two deuteriums on the same side of a ring. We definitely know that reaction. It definitely looks like we did some type of, you know, we did a hi uh, hydrogenation, syn addition, right? So on the same side. I know I got this. If I take this one step back, I had a double bond here, and I definitely used some D2 and a catalyst PDC, right? That makes sense. So now really all I need to do is just have, create some type of double bond. I just need an E2 reaction, right? So what I can do is if I just take this one step back, to make this happen, I need a good leaving group, right? And what's actually going to make this elimination happen is if I have a strong base, right? So I'll just use LDA. And if I want to use some nice solvent, I'll use some, uh, uh, I'll just use DMF. Why not? Some polar aprotic solvent could be D DMF, could be THF, whatever, whatever you want to use. Okay. So then going from here to here, that's right. Going with our day one, we're going to use the free radical chain reaction, BR2, light and heat. So, a small one. I know we're doing a couple of small ones first, but same idea. doesn't matter how big or, prob big or small the problem is. Going from the end to the beginning is a tried and true method that always works. Okay? All right. So, let's look at this one. Okay. So... Again, we're gonna stick with cyclopentane. These are the problems submitted by Rachel. So Rachel, if you're watching, shout out you for the, uh, the problems for everybody. Okay, so clearly we're doing cyclopentane and we see the cyclopentane we originally have, but we definitely introduce another carbon, right? So the only really big reaction we know and know can want to do that is a Grignard, right? So it looks like we're definitely gonna be working with a Grignard reaction here. So, what I think is nice and easy to work with is let's go backwards from here. So we have an E2 product here, right? But you can also see that we have the less substituted double bond, right? So if we're going to step this back one, obviously it, I think what will keep it easiest is if we have some type of halogen here. I'm just going to pick bromine. I could end up switching that. But I need a Hoffman elimination here. So I need a big bulky base. So I'm going to go with potassium terpenoxide and some DMSO, right? A non, a, a polar aprotic solvent. But the most important part being a big bulky base that eliminates at this position because he's so big and bulky, he is sterically hindered to get to the more substituted position to eliminate. Okay. Now, here's more of the tricky part. We're getting to a point. I know at some point I'm going to have this intermediate because this would be, this would be the evidence of a Grignard reaction, right? Somewhere where I have something that attacked a Grignard, right? This is, we're definitely gonna have a one carbon Grignard. And the alcohol is clearly the aftermath of attacking the carbonyl. So where did this, where did this uh, bromine come from? Well, if I look at the product that I'll get right after the Grignard reaction, it's actually really easy to make this happen. This is not a good leaving group, but if I threw in something like HBr, this acid would protonate my alcohol and solvolysis can happen, solvolysis could not happen. 
bromine, whether this leaves or not, bromine will attack at this position. No rearrangements occur. That's how I switch out my OH with a bromine here. Just a good old HBR attack. Okay. So now, let's get to the good part. Right here. This is my Grignard step, right? This is where I know I'm going to have a uh, quenching step of acid. And I know I throw in my CH3MGBR. And I need a uh, carbonyl, right? I know this is my Grignard piece. And I know that this carbon right here was the carbonyl. So I had a cyclopentanone right here, right? Just cyclopentane with a ketone. Okay. We can make this. I think this is pretty easy, right? You just need CH3Br. You toss in magnesium. You can get this by doing, uh, you know, free radical bromination from methane. Now let's keep going with this, right? I had a ketone, right? So I, to get a ketone, I know I have to oxidize an alcohol. And I don't have to worry about over-oxidizing or under-oxidizing here, so I'm just going to go with PCC. And then from here, to get the alcohol on, what I can do is if I had some bromine here, I could just use water to do SN1, right? Because bromine would leave. We would form this carbocation, water attacks, and then from here to here, it's another Br2, H new, heat type situation. Right, so this one, a little bit more involved. And it was just to add a carbon and a double bond. But if we take it step by step backwards, it's not bad, right? Because all we're doing is we know there's a Hoffman elimination, right? We need a big bulky base and a good leaving group. All right, so now, now that we conquered that hurdle, we gotta step it back more. We wanna get to this Grignard product because that's where we know we can actually connect pieces together. Just need an HBR to do a little swap of the alcohol with the halogen. So then we can actually break things apart into the Grignard phase, and then it's actually just synthesizing each individual piece. Okay. So let's keep going. One second. Whoop. Sorry, just looking at my, looking at the problems. Gotta erase this. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna go. I, we're gonna go until three thirty. Um. So if you're hanging around, I appreciate it. Okay. Last one of the cyclopentane ones, submitted by Rachel. This is actually a really good one. Not that the other ones aren't good. Okay. So, what we got here? Um, okay, this one's less obvious, but I think it helps to start at the end. So, we have this carbonyl. So, we clearly add one extra carbon, right? This guy right here. But luckily, we have this double bond that gives us some functionality to start with, right? But what I think is here is we never really, nothing, we, we know how to make carbonyls, right? Nothing when we attack produces carbonyls. Oxidations produce carbonyls. So I'm going to add some PCC, and I'm going to see if taking this back to an alcohol maybe gives me any, you know, spurs of uh, inspiration, right? Gives me a clear idea of what happened here. So this is less obvious, but we have this double bond, right? And you can see I added something here, and I added something here. This is something I typically miss all the time, and it's only in, until I exhaust the other options do I think of it. But this is evidence of attacking and epoxide, right? Because we have like one, two, three of uh, evidence of the one, two, three system right here. So if I actually draw, and there's no stereochemistry here, so I'm not gonna draw it. But if we have something like this, it's very easy to see that if I just toss in a methyl Grignard here, then you can see the evidence of tack here, kick up over there. So I would say this is the first step of the methyl Grignard Follow it up with a step of acid. We can even use H2SO4. But anytime you see like an alcohol left over and a group added next door, probably went with epoxide. Okay? And it's actually super easy to make this happen. Just a little MCPBA. Okay? So I know it was only three steps, but in my mind, 
and maybe it's just because I personally miss epoxide sometimes, I thought this was pretty clever. Okay? Yeah, so just make sure you see if you see a, like two carbons, one with an OH, and then a group added on the other one next door, you're probably going to epoxide build. Okay? All right, so now we're going to do a bigger synthesis problem. Then we'll do two NMR problems, which will be nice and quick, and then we are going to call it a Sunday, because you guys got things to do. You're probably sick of hearing me talk. I'm definitely sick of hearing myself talk. Um, one sec. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just using the awkward humming to fill the void. Okay, so let's look at this. Given acetylene, right? Acetylene is two carbons, triple bond, right? It's ethyne, but this is definitely a common name you should know, acetylene, which is weird because it has an E-N-E -E ending, but it's an alkyne. I don't make up the rules, just follow them. Okay. And then what we got is a five carbon triol. Five carbons with three alcohols. So, the rules of synthesis, especially when you have one where it's definitely stringing together a bunch of pieces. Don't freak out, count your carbons, and then start at the end and move backwards, okay? So clearly, if, if, if this is all we're given right here is two carbons, right? We see we have five carbons in the product, and we get to work with two carbons. This is a rare situation where it's annoying but we don't have like a multiple of our reactant that adds up to our finished product, right? And that doesn't make it impossible. We're just going to get a little creative. Okay, so clearly we're stringing things together. And clearly we're going to have to take this piece and maybe chop it in half. And I hope you that rang a bell because we have the ability to do that. All right, so let's start at the end. Because we're sticking pieces together, right? And that means we're going to do a Grignard reaction. I hope it shouldn't scare you to see an OH in the product. Now, we're seeing three of them, so that initially is very scary because it's like, where the hell did these th other two one, you know, alcohols come from? However, we do know a couple reactions that do piece together, or that do produce alcohols, right? So, let's try and simplify our problem, right? Because we can always restart, but let's try this. I know a reaction that produces two alcohols from a double bond. So let's just say, I know I'm gonna connect somewhere in the middle of my structure, so I'm gonna focus on this part, and I'm gonna say, what if I replace those two alcohols with a double bond? I'm not gonna to touch this alcohol at, our, at all, but if I take these two, if I back this up and make it a double bond, I know if I throw in osmium tetroxide and H2S, I know that produces some type of diol, so this would explain where the two alcohols come from, right? And even just that alone makes our product way less scary. At least in my opinion, I think it does. Okay? So, now we can take it even one more step back. I didn't, I did not say this during alkynes because I wanted to keep moving things along. But remember, with alkynes, you can take them, and if you throw in a strong base, you can deprotonate them, and you can make a good nucleophile like this. So alkynes are great nucleophiles, especially acetylene specifically. So what we can do is this is one nucleophile I'm definitely going to use and as like a stitching together point. However, I have no evidence of that in my current product. I have a double bond. However, I know a way if I wanted to say, oh, here's my triple bond that I definitely use to attack with to, let's say I had this, right? this would be a carbon that we attacked. All I would need is a one, a, like one hydrogenation step to make this happen, right? So just for fun, I'm just gonna use the sodium and the liquid ammonia, right? Because that right there would take me from a triple to a double. So now, right, we're starting to see pieces, or at least a piece of what we're given, and this problem is starting to become less scary, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna finally take this step, and I'm gonna break it, these two apart. Because once I do that, once I do this with a step with an acidic workup step, if I do this right here, plus 
uh, right here. This would be a three carbon piece with this right there because I need to attack a carbonyl, right? Then this part solves itself. I just need a strong base like LDA. Boom. This produces my alkynyl nucleophile, which then attacks this piece. So I already have half this problem solved, right? I just need to now figure out where this three carbon piece came from. But I don't have to start from here. I can just keep going backwards. So, right, to make an aldehyde, I need PCC. There's my three carbon alcohol right here. Now, it doesn't look like it, but there's evidence of a Grignard attack here. It's a, what would be a one carbonyl, one carbon carbonyl attacked by a, an ethyl Grignard. So if I step this back, or, mm, yeah, we could do it that way. What I can do is I can have formaldehyde plus, and there's an acidic workup step here, plus, uh, we'll do this for fun, ethyl Grignard. Actually, yeah, we'll do, we'll do ethyl Grignard, why not? Yeah, right? So I can make this, there's no problem with that. Or what I even do is I have like this, this could also come from here, right? It's just a hydrogenation step. This part's really not the important part. Where does this one carbon carbonyl come from? And very easily, all we actually need to do is notch this down one hydrogenation step to a double bond. And if I need one piece from two, I need to get out my molecular scissors, do ozone and zinc, and I actually make two one carbon carbonyls. So I know I kind of jumped around at the explanation towards the end, and I will we'll keep this. I can make this for you guys. What I can do is I can just hydrogenate this all the way, PDC to ethene or ethane, then I can free radical brominate it. And then I can just throw in the magnesium. Okay, so I knew I was a little bit all, all over the place at the end, but let me kind of rehash that. We took our, we looked at our final product. We saw a ton of alcohols. We could, you know, maybe we took a gamble. This was kind of, in my mind, just a disguising step that makes the problem more difficult. But we just saw, okay, we see two alcohols that we can definitely replace with a double bond if we use the osmium tetroxide reaction. From there, right, that gives us a double bond which we know could be evidence of a triple bond attack. So if we just take it back one step to a triple bond, we know we could have just hydrogenated one level to make this happen. Then we can actually make a cut, and we can actually see our acetylene nucleophile right here. So then that just leaves us with a simplified problem where we now have this three carbon piece to make, which we know, if we just take this back one oxidative step, right, is just another Grignard reaction. So we had a two carbon piece from our Grignard attack a one carbon aldehyde. And we got that by uh, hydrogenating the triple bond to a double bond and then clipping it in half, okay? I know that's kind of crazy. I like this problem just because it involves so much, a little bit of trickery, uh, a little bit of ozonolysis, which sometimes isn't in synthesis, sometimes it is. Uh, I think if you can handle this, you can pretty much handle anything. Okay, all right, so if you're still with me, we're gonna do some NMR real quick, and that will put us at the very end of this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful review session. The first ever Joe Kemp review session. Okay. So, NMR is something I was really bad at, not that I'm super great, at it now, but I think I have a system that works. So we're gonna do two quick problems of me giving you a, um, giving you a uh, spectrum, and then we're gonna deduce the structure, okay? So, at least this first one will be nice and easy to kind of establish some terminology to make sure you're good with it, and then we can go from there. Okay, so what you're seeing across this bottom right here, 
And if I'm being redundant, I'm sorry. It's just if you don't know the terminology of NMR, this stuff can be a nightmare. And it's HNMR, right? Because this is going to be, I'm just going to do proton NMR. I know you might have IR or even carbon NMR on your test. We're just, I don't have enough time. It's a lot. We're just going to keep our sanity and just do proton NMR. Right down here, right? Measured in ppm, this, those are some ugly brackets. Um, these numbers on the bottom signify the chemical shift, and that's given by delta. That's what delta is signifies. This is um, a measure of the deshielding of a proton, okay? So if you're farther up here, you're more upfield of your chemical shift, is up, like a, of a proton is upfield. If you're more down this way, your chemical shift of a proton is more downfield, okay? So, I'm gonna go ahead and draw a spectrum, and sorry, I had to draw this on paper, and I'm sorry if it's ugly, I'll try and make it as uh, clear as possible as to what I'm actually trying to draw. Okay. This will be more of a simpler one, and then we'll do a uh, more involved one. Okay. Okay. And I need to... Three. All right. So, things to remember about uh, when you're looking at a spectrum for NMR. When you have a peak, right? Right, like, like let's take this one for example. We can see that this peak, the protons that correspond to this peak have a chemical shift around one. So this is pretty upfield, which means it's not really around an electronegative atom, right? Because when you're around an electronegative atom, it takes you more downfield. Um, and we can see this number right here that corresponds to this peak. This is called the integration number. So this is how many hydrogens actually are represented by this peak. So three H's are represented by this peak, three by this one, two by this one. And I'll actually give you guys the chemical formula of this as well. Okay. So my process for NMR is this. The very first thing I do is I like to calculate the degrees of unsaturation. Right, this, these are rings and these are double bonds. So there's an easy way to do it if you just look at the formula, but there's also, or sorry, when you look at the chemical formula, but there's also a little mathematical one. When you're in OCHEM 2 and if your teacher's super in NMR and you get like nitrogens involved in there, this will be helpful, but we'll just use it for right now. But it's two times the number of carbons, which is four. And then plus a baked in two to the equation, plus the number of nitrogens, which is zero, minus the number of halogens, which is zero, minus the number of hydrogens, which is eight, divided by a baked in two. Okay, so if we do this math, the degrees of unsaturation for this equation is eight, 10, so 10 minus eight, two, divided by two is one. So we have one degree of unsaturation in this problem. All right, so, what I like to do after you calculate that is you make a light, nice little table below your spectrum with all the information, because really NMR is the game of organizing your info. So I'm gonna label these peaks. I'm gonna label this peak A, label this peak B, label this peak C. And in my table, I'm gonna have a, a row for A, B, and C. Okay, so. In this table, we're gonna list information about this and I'm gonna tell you guys, I know it's annoying, I know it might be some you know work, but this is the easiest way to not lose your brain when you're just trying to look at something like this. Because I know you could pick out individual details, but if you have it organized, laid out in front of you, it makes a world of a difference. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to do, write the chemical shift. The chemical shift, what's called the coupling, and we'll talk about that. I'm sure you guys know what this is especially when we start giving it terms. Then uh, the integration number. Um, how many neighbors? 
the hydrogen has. Actually, well, yeah, I mean neighbors, which kind of goes hand, uh, hand in hand with coupling. And then the how we think this actually is going to appear. Okay, so chemical shift, right? For A, we're looking at, I, and I can't really draw this too well, but this is supposed to be like two and a half. For B, we're looking at more like a 2.1, it's rough. And then for three, something like 0 0.9 or one, doesn't matter, something, somewhere around one. All right, so coupling, right? This is actually the shape of the peak. So for, the, for A, we're looking at, so we see one, two, three, four. This is a quartet. We're gonna assume first order. Uh, B is a singlet. And C is a, oh, a triplet. Again, corresponds to the peaks on the signal on the spectrum. All right, integration number. That's super easy, you pick it right off. Two, three, three. Okay, so here's what we mean by this. So for neighbors, right, your coupling, you get that from the N plus one rule, which means count neighbors and then the actual hydrogen itself, like the position, right? So it's kind of just a step down from whatever the coupling is. So quartet, I know, Position A has three neighboring hydrogens. That's what this column is for. B, since it's a singlet, it actually has zero neighboring hydrogens And for B. And for C, if it's a triplet, then we have two neighboring hydrogens. Okay, so what's nice is all this information helps us fill out this last column, and then it helps us really deduce the structure. Okay, so I don't have a chemical shift table. I wish I could somehow nicely show that to you guys right now, but for something in this like mid two range, um, what you might be seeing is something next door to a carbonyl. So when I say next door to a carbonyl, this is like an R group, this is like an R or whatever group. I'm talking about being alpha, being next door to a carbonyl, this position right here. This will give you, because being next door to this double bonded O, D shields you, D shields these hydrogens and brings the spectrum, the, the signal for that position downfield. Okay? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to use the terminology to reinforce it. So, not a su so what this could look like, because we have only have four carbons, what this could look like is if we have something like this, this could be our position right here, and I could have two neighbors right here, right? Because this position has, um, oh, three neighbors rather, sorry. This position, this could be three neighbors right here to this carbon. And so the, the carbonyl satisfies the chemical shift. We have our neighbors as well as, uh, that would give us a quartet. And two hydrogens could be here, which satisfies our integration number. So just potentially. All right, so for B, we have a singlet, okay? So we have roughly the same chemical shift, right? And I kind of made, I self-reported this number. This could be like a 2.2, whatever. There's no neighbors for this carbon. So what you'll see a lot, especially when we have one degree of unsaturation, we probably have a ketone. This guy probably looks like this. He has no neighbors because the carbon he's next to doesn't have any hydrogens that he can split with. So. These three hydrogens, which align with our integration number, could be chilling right here. And our last one, we have a triplet. Whenever you have a triplet that's hanging around the one chemical shift region, it's usually a methyl group on the end of a structure. That's like almost always, that's pretty much a given, okay? So we got something hanging, so this guy's hanging out like this. He's not downfield, three hydrogens, nothing to bring him downfield, and he's got two neighbors, right? So. I think the structure looks like this. There's two carbons because uh, this is our singlet. This would be position B. And if we even just fill out the rest of the chain, you'll see that that matches perfectly, okay? I know I kind of belabored this example, but I think it's gonna really help us in this next example where, uh, that I'm about to show you. Okay. All right. Try and keep my spectrum just to raise the table. I'm gonna go a little faster on this one. 
because I know we're already over time. Okay. So let me look at the spectrum. One more peak. Okay. All right, so we'll go through this much faster. Let me just get situated real quick. Okay. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I think this is right. I'm really hoping it is. Otherwise, yeah. All right, so let's say this is our spectrum. Last problem, so don't get too sad, but we're wrapping up soon. Okay, so here's our spectrum. Without looking at without looking at anything else, let's just do our degrees of unsaturation real quick. Okay, so two times seven carbons plus the baked in two plus zero nitrogens minus zero halogens minus... 14 hydrogens divided by a baked in two. So you can see from the math in the numerator, we get a solid that's 16 minus 14, two divided by two. Well, 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 we got another degree of unsaturation. Okay, so let's make our table. So I'm just gonna randomly sign A, B, C, D. Doesn't matter how you do that. But let's do A, B, C, and D. Let's do our lines. Line here. Cross the top. Okay. So let's report our chemical shifts. So it looks like for A, we're chilling in like a 3.1 range. This would be way more exact. This is obviously just a very rough sketch. So for two, we're hanging out in the low twos. Let's just say like 2.2. For C, it's going to be like 1.3. And for D, we're hanging out like at 0 0.9, something like that. So I hope you're looking at this and maybe even jumping ahead in your head, like in your brain and thinking, wow, D really looks like not just a methyl group, but it would be like three equivalent symmetrical methyl groups. Okay. So after that, we got our, uh, I always, all right, yeah. So we got to do our coupling. What do these peaks look like? Okay, so A looks like a triplet, B looks like a singlet, uh, C is another triplet, and D is a singlet. Okay, alrighty, Roo. And then we gotta do our integration numbers, which is super easy. We're just gonna pluck those straight off the spectrum. Two, three, two, nine. And then we're going to do our neighbors. Which remember is just a notch down from your coupling. So this will be two neighbors, zero neighbors, two neighbors, zero neighbors. Okay. And then, is it appearance then? Yeah, we got, now we get to do a little deducing. Okay. So, D looks, let's start with D. It's very interesting that it looks like, it's definitely, if it was an integration of three and neighbors of two, it would definitely look like it would just be a methyl group on the end of a chain. However, this is definitely gonna be a methyl group, but we have zero neighbors, which is interesting because a really good way to have neighbor, no neighbors is to be next door to a carbonyl on the end of a chain like this. But, this would be R. But we're not downfield. We have a regular, pretty, very far upfield chemical shift. The other way to have like that z z like zero splitting with other people and zero neighbors is if you're on the end of a chain 
like this and you have a bunch of methyl groups and there's a quaternary carbon like that. So there's a really good chance that we look like this for our three methyl groups. That would definitely account for the integration, how many neighbors we have, and give us a, sing a singlet type uh, splitting pattern. Okay, so if we look at C, C looks like, you know, it's very upfield. It has two neighbors. It looks like if we had this type of thing on the end of our chain right here, and we just kept drawing, it looks like C could be right here. Because if we kept drawing this chain, if this was C right here, there's nothing, there's no neighbors he'd be splitting with over here. And if the chain kept going, he would have two neighbors, if this was C, we would have two neighbors, as well as, uh, you know, an integration of two as well. So it looks like C is just going to be um, this guy right here, as long as we keep going. All right, so now let's look at B. Uh, all right, so B is a singlet, okay, with an integration of three. And its chemical shift aligns more like in this situation, right? And we do have one degree of unsaturation. So if we just put this on hold for a second, it looks like B could, B could be uh, our carbonyl on the end type scenario, okay? And if we look at A, A looks like it's pretty down, I mean, it's a little bit more downfield than everybody else. And it's a triplet, integration of two with two neighbors, so, we definitely have a carbonyl, but we also have two oxygens. So I hope that maybe if we stitch this structure together, this makes sense to you guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, that's eight. Did I do this right? Hold on. Hmm. Or did I need one less carbon? Or did I need, maybe I needed, I think this would have been the chemical formula. I think I needed this. doesn't change anything. I just started off with the wrong. Because we, if I bump that up to 8 and 16, we still get a degree of unsaturation of, of 1. Because 8 here, 16 here. Because that would be, this would be uh, 16 plus 2 minus 16. Still 2 divided by 2. I just needed that to be C8H16. I adapted an, uh, a different example to make it a little bit different. But this gives us everything we need. These right here are the methyl groups that are singlets. These guys right here account for the two triplets. This is so far downfield, or downfield I should rather say, because it's directly, it's an ether. Well, this is the ether part of the ester, directly attached, so that brings it more, it de-shields these two protons. And then this right here gives us the singlet that's more downfield than the other singlet. Okay. Ugh. All right, guys. Thank you for rocking out with me. I've never done this before, so I hope, I know it was a bit, uh, the beginning of the Facebook Live was a little rough. I was flipping the camera around, didn't know what I was doing. Thanks for tuning in. This year for Joe Chem, since January of 2017 till this past August, I we had gotten 15,000 plays on, my, on the videos on the site. Just these past few months alone, already up to 26,000 plays. So thank you. If you're using the site, thank you. It, I made it because I wanted to help people learn what I think is a pretty awesome subject. Moving forward, I think I'm going to continue to do these, like maybe I'll do exam reviews. So it's even like, it can be smaller, more chunked up, more easily digestible, but I will be trying to add more and more content. I know that right now with my current job, I like to do things for that. It involves coding which takes away from like, you know, my lovely OCHEM time. But uh, I'm gonna try my best to keep adding content. I just wanna say thank you for using the site. I'm pumped that it's still being used. And uh, like I said, I'm gonna download this, put it up on JoeChem whenever it's available from Facebook. Um, we'll be doing this in the future. Good luck on finals, you got this. And uh, thanks for tuning in.